when you have a precedent set like that, and you have somebody, George Tennant, acknowledging in his book that he knew that the administration was deceiving the American people into a situation that is murdering young men and women from this country and others, that George Tennant and Dick Cheney and Condoleezza Rice and George Bush et al. should be in fucking jail. In the CIA, we didn't give a hoot about democracy. I mean, it was fine if, if a government was elected and would cooperate with us, but um, if it didn't, then democracy didn't mean a thing to us. And I don't think it means a thing today. We just wanted to you know what your take was on it and if you were dubious. Sure. But I did not want to believe that my government could possibly be involved in such a Absolutely, thing. I don't think you any know, of us want to. I couldn't yeah. live in a country that I thought could do that. Exactly. That would be the ultimate betrayal. Sure. Then, however, uh, there's been so many uh, uh, revelations that uh, now I have my doubts. And, and chief among them is the Building 7. How did they break that building so that it came down on the evening of the day? Are you afraid they do it? Fortunately for us, all our clients were in gold. So when it went up, they all doubled their money. Everybody doubled their money. It was a blessing in disguise. People say it's, it's just another year and a half. It's not just another year and a half of these abuses. Hi, I'm Mark Ruffalo. If we don't stand up right now and say no, then we are telling anybody that comes into power, we put into power, Republican or Democrat or other, that we don't care about our Constitution or the good name of our nation. I'm asking you to prescribe impeachment. And by doing so today, not only do we hold the Bush and Cheney administration accountable for their high crimes and misdemeanors, but we take the first steps in dismantling this monarchy that has been built in secrecy behind closed doors over the past 10 years. The threatening war, it is humanity hanging from a cross of iron. My father, as president, had strong guiding principles. He used to say modern weapons take food from the hungry and shelter from the homeless. And so he was fighting with the Pentagon all the time for asking for too much and Congress for giving it to him. I don't think we should pay one cent for defense more than we have to. Well, Eisenhower saw us starting to build program after program that was just out of control and his own ability to shape national security policy was being hemmed in by these forces he couldn't control, and he was the president. On at least one occasion, Eisenhower was heard to say by those in the room, God help this country when somebody sits at this desk who doesn't know as much about the military as I do. My fellow Americans, this evening, I come to you with a message of leave-taking and farewell, and to share a few final thoughts with you, my countrymen. We have been compelled to create a permanent armaments industry of vast proportions. Three and a half million men and women are directly engaged in the defense establishment. The total influence, economic, political, even spiritual, is felt in every city, every state house, every office of the federal government. 
We recognize the imperative need for this development. Yet we must not fail to comprehend its grave implications. In the councils of government, we must guard against the acquisition of unwarranted influence, whether sought or unsought, by the military-industrial complex. The potential for the disastrous rise of misplaced power exists and will persist. You have to realize this is one of the great presidents, great military leaders, on his way out the door. And at the end of his second term, he says, by the way, watch out for the military-industrial complex. People know that he invented the phrase military-industrial complex, but very rarely do you see the whole thing and realize how utterly strident his warning was. I think it's one of the most profound statements ever made by an American president. Just like George Washington gave his warnings about foreign entanglements and things like that, my dad was giving his warning against letting this military-industrial complex get out of hand. We must never let the weight of this combination endanger our liberties or democratic processes. People sometimes think of the defense budget as you got to arm the troops, defend the nation. But for most people that are involved in it, you realize this is business, competition for contracts between very large corporations. Industry has to have a bottom line that's black, otherwise their shareholders don't like that. So they have to find ways to interest the government in continuing to buy the product. Lockheed Martin and McDonnell Douglas and Boeing throughout America. There are factories, there are corporations that are involved on a daily basis to produce the weaponry, the ammunition, to carry out the American way of war. The American way of war has been described as overwhelming firepower supported by overwhelming logistics. For every shooter out there, every man with a gun, there are hundreds behind supporting, providing the ammunition, the boots, the gas for the tanks, the oil. You wrap the flag around every weapon system. Every weapon system is supposed to be for the troops, give the soldier the tools they need. But really what it ends up becoming is product competition. If you had the same car year after year, if industry didn't change the car at all, would you buy a different car? No, but when they come out with something that's got extra bells and whistles on it that suits what you need it to do, then you'll buy more. If you look at the weapons that we're buying, new aircraft carriers, new submarines, F-22 fighters, you know, for an attack that the FBI estimates probably cost uh, Al-Qaeda or Osama 500K to pull off, uh, we are now spending more than we did at the peak of Vietnam. A lot of what's going on is simply because people don't understand the larger architecture of how the Pentagon operates. Mr. Chairman and uh, distinguished members of the committee, I am the U.S. Air Force Program Manager for the Boeing Company. Let's use the example of buying a weapon, like a new fighter plane for the Air Force. The action usually starts in the Pentagon, maybe at the contractor's initiative, but essentially everybody's working together. The KC-767A can carry up to 190 troops. Basically what you do is you come in and you lowball the initial estimate. The actual then your cost is about half that estimate. You overpromise what it's going to do, and you underestimate the kind of burdens it's going to impose. We separately met with the companies, and both proposals are very good. Both Once the Air Force buys off on it, then you start flooding money to as many congressional districts as possible, as quickly as possible. The V-2 bomber has a piece of it made in every single state to make sure that if you ever tried to phase that project out, you will get howls, howls from among the most liberal members of Congress. I believe in this military. I am urging the Senate to support this bill. $66 billion for our men and women in uniform. Well, I just want to thank the chairman for working with me and adding $100 million to upgrade 10 additional B-1 bombers. And that B-1 has been a great asset for the projection of power. The, the F-35 Joint Strike Fighter, the F-A-22 Raptor. And the because the military-industrial complex is not two links, it's three. It's the military and the industry and Congress. For a congressman, defense spending means jobs. Humvees are manufactured in my district in Mishawaka, Indiana by... Losing 100 defense jobs in his district could mean 500 votes. This is the map of the United States. And this 
is the map of the weapons industry in the U.S. Almost each one of the 50 states hosts some component of the military arsenal. Large defense companies are spread across the United States, sometimes strategically. It's the strategy of what's been called the military-industrial complex, or even the military-industrial congressional complex. The same huge machinery of power that President Eisenhower started seeing as a threat back in 1961. This is the strategy of power. Weapon manufacturing giants like Lockheed Martin, Boeing, or General Electric spread their plants across as many states as possible. More states means more seats in Congress to defend their interests. More seats in Congress means more money in the defense budget and multi-million contracts won by the weapons firms, which means more jobs for that district, which equals more votes to that congressman who assigned those contracts to be re-elected. So the trade is more money in weapons in exchange for more votes, or what's known as pork barrel politics. Pork barrel politics have a long history in the United States. Pork actually used to be kept in barrels. That would be a source of food for your family. And so it gets at this idea of politicians bringing something that the people who voted for them need. Um, it's a little bit crass, but just refers to the addition of, I guess, fatty deposits in the budget. What they're talking about is spending on particular weapon systems that don't contribute to national security but are pushed because they benefit members of a certain state or district. Take the C-17, a large cargo plane built by Boeing that Congress keeps adding to the defense budget, even though the Pentagon says they have plenty of. We have 250 of them. They don't need any more. But every year, Congress adds from 5 to 10 more C-17s because the program is spread across 44 states. It has very, very many congressional interests. The defense budget even still covered for obsolete big dinosaurs of the Cold War era, like the F-22 Raptor that was only recently killed. Many people said, why do we need this? Well, the manufacturer, Lockheed, moved the plant to make it to Georgia, where you had the Speaker of the House was from Georgia, the Chairman of the Senate Armed Services Committee was from Georgia, and so the United States spent something like $65 billion to buy these planes to deal with a threat that doesn't exist anymore. It's very hard to vote against hundreds of jobs, even if you're voting for a program that you don't need. So are we talking about defending the country or defending jobs in a recession? Well, if you're looking at government spending as a way to stimulate the economy, defense is the least effective way to do it. And so it has come to pass. Defense budgets have kept growing, inflated with fat, every year since 9-11. But in an age of austerity, something's got to give. We simply cannot continue to spend as if deficits don't have consequences, as if waste doesn't matter. But can a president ever win this old battle, which so many before have lost? Beginning in the 1980s, a belief has slowly taken over the world that neoliberal globalization with its built-in self-regulating mechanisms would finally do away with old institutions like the state and the military and would usher the planet into an era of relative peace and prosperity. Free trade will bring on a great depression. 9-11 and the current economic crisis have shown that belief to be largely a myth. Many signs were already there. Markets have always relied on state power and military might. America's transformation from republic to economic superpower following World War II was accompanied by the creation of a global network of military bases unlike any other in history. According to the Pentagon's base structure report, today these amount to 716 in 38 countries. More than 250,000 soldiers are stationed on these bases. 
In addition to this, the US has a military presence in 110 countries around the world. A year after his election, Barack Obama approved the new administration's first military budget. This amounts to $680 billion, 30 billion more than Bush's last defense budget, and almost equaling the $787 billion set aside by the new administration for the economic crisis stimulus pact. The unit of empire in the classic European empires was the colony. Uh, the unit for the American empire is not the colony, it's the military base. Bases are the empire. They're the, uh, the point of projection of power and expansion of power. Most people don't uh, understand that the bases exist, uh, don't understand the functions of, of military bases. Uh, and, and it's much, frankly, it's much easier for people to engage uh, with things like you know, an atrocious war in Iraq. Um, uh, question of torture, things that immediately outrage them. These are internet stations where soldiers can ch not only check the internet, but they also have the capability of uh, doing webcams back home. You can go in. To focus on war and not war preparation is to simply shovel after the elephant. One has to look at the war preparations that are going on around the world, which military bases are central to. Um, if one doesn't pay attention to that, um, then uh, again, we can only deal with the symptoms, um, which, is, which is warfare. There's a saying that goes, when soldiers come, war comes.